What's up, survivalists? This is Richie McWicked. Just wanted to give you guys an update. Um, there has been a uh, solar flare reported. Um, the solar storm is headed toward Earth and may disrupt power. Uh, this is from Washington. Uh, the largest solar flare in five years is racing toward Earth, threatening to unleash a torrent of charged particles that could disrupt power grids, GPS, and airplane flights. Uh, the sun erupted on Tuesday evening, and the effects should start smacking Earth around 7 a.m. Thursday morning. That would be 7 a.m. Eastern Time. Um, according to forecasters at the Federal Government's Space Weather Prediction Center, they say the flare is growing as it speeds outward from the sun. It's hitting us right in the nose, said Joe uh, Kunchis, a scientist for National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. He called it the sun's version of Super Tuesday. The solar storm is likely to last through Friday morning, but the region that erupted can still send more blasts our way. Uh, Kunches said he also says another set of active spots is ready to aim at Earth right after this. <clears throat> but for now, scientists are waiting to see what happens Thursday when the charged particles hit Earth at 4 million miles per hour. Uh, NASA solar physicist Alex Young added it could give us a bit of a jolt, but he said this is far from a super solar storm. Uh, the storm is coming after an earlier and weaker solar eruption hat that happened Sunday. Uh, this newer blast of particles will probably arrive slightly later than forecasters initially thought. Um, okay, so these, this, are, this is an X-class flare. It has been categorized as an X-class flare, and it is plummeting at Earth or toward Earth at 4 million miles an hour. Um, these are the types of things that we've been talking about and looking for. Uh, definitely plan for this activity. Um, on the um, positive end of things, this could all maybe just create a couple of little isolated blackouts, um, maybe take out some transformers. Uh, locally here by me, the last time we had some X-classes hit Earth, actually they just glanced off Earth, I believe that was back in September or October, and uh, it did blast a few, for, uh, melt a few transformers in town and uh, blacked out um, small portions of where I live uh, throughout the night. Um, that, of course, could happen again with this. Um, this is a, it's the same class, except instead of a glancing blow, this one is plummeting directly toward Earth and going to hit us right square smack dab right in the nose. Um, so, uh, worst case scenarios could include something on the level of the Carrington event, uh, which happened back in 1859. Uh, the Carrington event was uh, responsible for um, frying telegraph wires uh, globally uh, to the point where even at telegraph terminals, loca terminal locations, uh, unplugging the telegraph uh, wasn't enough to shut them down and um, telegraph uh, paper was actually set on fire as well. Um, if something at the, of that magnitude hit the earth today, that would knock every single satellite dead in our atmosphere and probably wipe out, wipe out the global power grids. Um, and that would send us back a hundred years in time as far as tech because it would take an awfully long time to come back from that kind of uh, technological failure. Um, and our uh, system of technology right now has never been more fragile uh, with every aspect of our lives controlled by technology. Um, so there will be a lot of rethinking needing to be done. So um, on that note, I'm going to leave you guys with uh, an audio article. Um, from 2008 uh, that basically describes the Carrington event and uh, so you can get a good idea of what it did um, to technology back in 1859 and then just kind of uh, correlate that kind of uh, that magnitude of a solar flare and imagine what it could do to today's uh, technological society. I'll leave all of those uh, the imagination up to you on that one. But again, thanks for watching. My name is Richie McWicked. Appreciate it, survivalists. We'll talk to you soon and I'm out. A Super Solar Flare, presented by Science at NASA. May 6, 2008. At 11.18 a.m. on the cloudless morning of Thursday, September 1st, 1859, 33-year-old Richard Carrington, widely acknowledged to be one of England's foremost solar astronomers, was in his well-appointed private observatory. Just as usual on every sunny day, his telescope was projecting an 11-inch wide image of the sun on a screen, and Carrington skillfully drew the sunspots he saw. On that particular morning, he was capturing the likeness of an enormous group of sunspots. Suddenly, before his eyes, two brilliant beads of blinding white light appeared over the spots, intensified rapidly, and became kidney-shaped. 
realizing that he was witnessing something unprecedented and being, quote, somewhat flurried by the surprise, Carrington later admitted. I hastily ran to call someone to witness the exhibition with me. On returning within 60 seconds, I was mortified to find it was already changed and enfeebled. He and his witness watched as the white spots contracted to mere pinpoints and disappeared. It was 11.23 a.m. Only five minutes had passed. Just before dawn the next day, skies all over planet Earth erupted in red, green, and purple auroras, so brilliant that newspapers could be read as easily as in daylight. Indeed, stunning auroras pulsated even at near-tropical latitudes over Cuba, the Bahamas, Jamaica, El Salvador, and Hawaii. Even more disconcerting, telegraph systems worldwide went haywire. Spark discharges shocked telegraph operators and set the telegraph paper on fire. Even when telegraphers disconnected the batteries powering the lines, aurora-induced electric currents in the wires still allowed messages to be transmitted. What Carrington saw was a white light solar flare, a ferocious magnetic explosion on the sun, explains David Hathaway, solar physics team lead at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. Nowadays, we know that solar flares happen frequently, especially during solar sunspot maximum. Most betray their existence by releasing X-rays, recorded by X-ray telescopes in space, and radio noise, recorded by radio telescopes in space and on Earth. In Carrington's day, however, there were no X-ray satellites or radio telescopes. No one knew flares existed, until that one September morning, when a super flare produced enough light to rival the brightness of the sun itself. It's rare that one can actually see the brightening of the solar surface, says Hathaway. It takes a lot of energy to heat up the surface of the sun. The explosion produced not only a surge of visible light, but also a mammoth cloud of charged particles in detached magnetic loops, a CME, and hurled that cloud directly toward Earth. The next morning, when the CME arrived, it crashed into Earth's magnetic field, causing the global bubble of magnetism that surrounds our planet to shake and quiver. Researchers called this a geomagnetic storm. Rapidly moving fields induced enormous electric currents that surged through telegraph lines and disrupted communications. More than 35 years ago, I began drawing the attention of the space physics community to the 1859 flare and its impact on telecommunications, says Louis Lanzarotti, retired distinguished member of the technical staff at Bell Labs and current editor of the journal Space Weather. He himself became aware of the effects of solar geomagnetic storms on terrestrial communications when a huge solar flare on August 4, 1972, knocked out long-distance telephone communication across Illinois. That event, in fact, caused AT&T to redesign its power system for transatlantic cables. A similar flare on March 13, 1989, provoked geomagnetic storms that disrupted electric power transmission from the Hydro-Quebec generating station in Canada, blacking out most of the province and plunging six million people into darkness for nine hours. Aurora-induced power surges even melted power transformers in New Jersey. In December 2005, X-rays from another solar storm disrupted satellite-to-ground communications and global positioning system navigation signals for about 10 minutes. That may not sound like much, but as Lanzarote noted, I would not have wanted to be on a commercial airline being guided in for a landing by GPS or on a ship being docked by GPS during that 10 minutes. Another Carrington-class flare would dwarf these events. Fortunately, says Hathaway, they appear to be rare. In the 160-year record of geomagnetic storms, he says, the Carrington event is the biggest. It's possible to delve back even farther in time by examining Arctic ice. Energetic particles leave a record in nitrates and ice cores, he explains. Here again, the Carrington event sticks out as the biggest in 500 years, and nearly twice as big as the runner-up. These statistics suggest that Carrington flares are once-in-a-half millennium events. The statistics are far from solid, however, and Hathaway cautions that we don't understand flares well enough to rule out a repeat in our lifetime. And what then? Lanzarotti points out that as electronic technologies have become more sophisticated and more embedded into everyday life, they have also become more vulnerable to solar activity. Here on Earth, power lines and long-distance telephone cables could be affected by auroral currents just as they were in 1989. Radar, cell phone communications, and GPS receivers could be disrupted by solar radio noise. 
Experts who have studied the question say, furthermore, there is little to be done to protect satellites from a Carrington-class flare. In fact, a recent paper estimates potential damage to the 900-plus satellites currently in orbit could cost between 30 to 70 billion dollars. The best solution, they say? Have a pipeline of new commsats ready for launch after the flare. Humans in space would be in peril, too. Spacewalking astronauts might have only minutes after the first flash of light to find shelter from energetic solar particles following close on the heels of those initial photons. Their spacecraft would probably have adequate shielding. The key would be getting inside in time. No wonder NASA and other space agencies around the world have made the study and prediction of flares a priority. Right now, a fleet of spacecraft is monitoring the sun, gathering data on flares big and small that may eventually reveal what triggers the explosions. SOHO, Inode, Stereo, ACE, and others are already in orbit, while new spacecraft, such as the Solar Dynamics Observatory, are readying for launch. Research won't prevent another Carrington flare, but it may make the flurry of surprise a thing of the past. This story was written by Trudy Bell and Tony Phillips and presented by Science at NASA.